Hello, everybody. Uh, I just wanted to put out this explainer video uh, to explain some of what is going on with regards to this COVID-19 crisis uh, and the economic Im impact and recommended actions uh, that I believe should, should be looked at very seriously. Uh, so, so I'm just going to go ahead and make these points. So understanding the COVID-19 economic impact and understanding the actions recommended, what I'm trying to do here is given all the discussion around the economic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, this presentation is an attempt to provide clarity on the practical problem and the practical actions that government should take. And while the presenter, that is me, I'm a computer engineer and an entrepreneur, and I'm not an economist, but this explainer video is to try and boil the problem down to its key facets so any regular person uh, can understand what is going on. The content of this presentation is also inspired by an Elon Musk quote, if you know about Elon Musk from Tesla, SpaceX and such, uh, where he has said that any person who tries to explain any complex problem and cannot do so at the level a 10-year-old can understand probably does not know what they are talking about. So this was very inspiring for me because it really helped me relate to a lot of things and connect the dots a lot faster. And what uh, the attempt in this video is to present the concepts in a very simplistic manner so everybody can understand. That is my hope. So what we need to do to understand what is going on is firstly imagine the following thought experiment. And, and a thought experiment is something that you just imagine to try and understand something a little better. So imagine this isolated island population that is part of the world economy, uh, like one of the US Pacific islands, for example. So we will start with this thought experiment. And if you can imagine an island like Rarotonga, this is a real island, which is part of the Cook Islands. And this island has a population of approximately 10,000 people. So I've kind of broken it down to give you uh, uh, the presentation in a manner that you can understand all the pieces at play. So imagine this island which is isolated with 10,000 people. In this thought experiment, uh, this island which is part of the world, world economy as we know it today or as we know it before this COVID-19 crisis, uh, it's 20 years in the past. So let's imagine this is what I'm going to talk about is now happening in the year 2000, so 20 years ago. So this isolated island population 20 years ago in the year 2000 is suddenly cut off from the rest of the world indefinitely. And this happened. Uh, so you need to just imagine in this thought experiment that a catastrophic world event occurred and this island is now cut off from the rest of the world. There is no transportation, no communication, no connection to the world. They are completely isolated. Just assume that their monetary system or the, the means of money to buy and sell things on this island was digital and just assume that it was connected to the rest of the world. So once they are isolated, there is an immediate impact to their economic activity as the existing monetary system does not function and the islanders have to figure out what to do to manage on their own. Now, being in isolation indefinitely, so for the first few days, they were hoping that uh, something would change, but nothing changed. So the island decided to elect an island council, which is a group of people, the smartest people on the island, to try to manage the affairs of the island. So in this thought experiment, after the catastrophic event, the island, which had a lot of smart people, had an election. They elected their council of ministers and the head of the island council. This newly elected council of ministers and elected head quickly swings into action to try to decide how can they manage the affairs of the isolated island given the crisis that they were in. But now, very quickly, they realized that, again, this is a thought experiment. So just imagine the following, right? So the, the elected council immediately realizes and focuses on the key problem. And the key problem was that since the system that allowed them to make payments for buying and selling was down after they got disconnected from the real world, uh, people who existed on the island, so these 10,000 people could not pay for anything, even though everything else on the island was very normal. There was just no system working for making payments. So that was the key problem to start with. Because the day after the existing payment system stopped working, the very next day, people were very normal. They were able to go and work in their fields and farms and factories and offices. Nothing changed there. 
The only change was the lack of a system for them to make and track payments. Now, as all of you would know, without a medium of exchange, which we all know as money, without a medium of exchange working, people were not able to buy goods or services. And thus, economic activity was quickly grinding to a halt, even though there was plenty of everything available to buy. So there was plenty of fish and food and groceries and produce and vegetables and such. But since nobody could make a payment, they couldn't go out there and buy. And because no, the sellers couldn't get the money, they were afraid to sell. Uh, and, and obviously, the system was getting stuck. So obviously, in a situation like that, as you can imagine, some bartering will quickly start happening. Somebody will say, I will give you my fish if you can give me your mangoes, and I will give you my mangoes if you can give me your bananas, and so on and so forth. So all of you know the bartering system, which is just exchanging goods as a, to, to move things around, right? But the key problem simply was that there was no functioning system other than bartering for the people to use as a medium of exchange to buy whatever they wanted to buy, right? Now, being a smart and intelligent community, even though they were isolated, the council quickly decided to introduce an alternative currency, and they call this currency island dollars, okay? So this is a brand new currency, they decided to do it. And since the monetary system and currency that existed was no longer functional, they decided to create a baseline of money for their islanders by distributing island dollars to every person on the island. So you have to imagine that before the this, disconnection happened there were very rich people on the island there were middle class people on the island and there were the poor people on the island who were daily wage workers right but the moment the system got disconnected the accounting and tracking of the value of money that each of those people had was immediately lost so everybody became equal the day they had to start from zero right so the island council then decided to uh, so since everybody was starting from scratch uh, uh, you know, the earlier wealth that they had, everybody lost track of it, right? So their net worth had disappeared. So the council decided to launch their own island-based digital money. And they started every person out with $100,000 in island dollars. So they gave everybody 100000 or in India, like we say, $1 lakh. So they gave everybody the same amount of money. All 10,000 people got $100,000 each, okay? And by doing that, if you many of you have played the game of Monopoly, and when you start playing the game of Monopoly, everybody starts with the same amount of money. So just imagine something similar, right? Everybody started with the same baseline, which is $100,000. Now, once this was done, immediately people could now pay for goods and services and the economic activity resumed. So this digital payment system that I'm talking about here, just imagine it like something along the lines of a Google Pay or a Zelle or a Paytm in India, right? So this payment system, that was available for the people to now buy and sell things again with the $100,000 that they got immediately allowed the economic activity to resume and the prices of everything was just as usual determined by the market forces of demand and supply. So they sorted out the immediate problem when they introduced their new currency of island dollars. So with this economic activity was sustained and stimulated for this island, even though every single islander started out with $100,000 in island dollars over, over a period of time, the market economics and capitalism took over and some people started getting rich, others squandered or lost their money, and most of them maintained a middle class lifestyle. All right. But from then on, the islanders continued to live their normal lives and worked hard to earn a basic, uh, a better, or to, worked hard to earn a better living, generally doing pretty much everything all of us do in the real world today to improve our lives. So this is now the new normal after they uh, address the crisis that they faced in the year 2000. All right. And life became very normal, just like we are used to it in the real world today. Now, fast forwarding 20 years ahead to today, which is the year 2020, there was another sudden black swan or unexpected event. Now, one fine morning in January 2020, the islanders get to know that their digital payment system has gone down as there was a fire in their main computer center building. So the overall payment system was not working anymore. So just assume when they solved the problem in the year 2000, they had a big computer center building that had all the computers in place to track this digital money going back and forth. 
as the original 100,000 distributed to their citizens were used for payments and buying and selling for all the economic activity. So now suddenly in January 2020, one fine day, that's, that building caught fire and all the systems burned. So even though they had backups of all their data, so they didn't lose their data, they have backups so they know who is rich, who is poor, who has how much money, they know. But the computers have been burned, so they cannot run the payment system uh, without before they, they solve the problem and bring that computer center back up again, right? So again, this is a thought experiment, so just stay with me here. So as the Island Council gathered to meet and discuss the impact of this unexpected catastrophic event, it was clear to them pretty quickly that it would be months before they could restore their payments and functional monetary system. So immediately they knew that they were in a crisis again, right? Because the existing system to buy and sell had suddenly gone down. So once the payment system went down, the island was again going through a crisis as again, people were unable to pay for goods and services and economic activity started slowing down in days. Food was going waste, fish was rotting with no buyers, restaurants were empty as people could not pay, grocery stores had no provisions. I mean, they had provisions, but they had no buyers because people could not pay, right? So reviewing all the options they had, once the Island Council concluded there was, there was no guarantee by when they could bring back their payment system and monetary system, they immediately started looking for options to restore economic activity on their island again. So they were smart people. They're like, okay, we have a crisis. What do we do? We had the crisis in 2000, we fixed the problem. Here's the crisis again in 2020, what do we do? So they started reviewing all the options and they realized that while their monetary system was down, they could not track how much money each islander had and which islanders had no money at all. So they, even though they had the data, because there were no computers working, they could not really check the data to see where was all the money. So with that problem, they finally decided to come up with an interim arrangement. So they like, you know, till we bring our computer center back up, what do we do? So to allow economic activity on the island to continue, while the digital payment system was down, they realized that they had a printing press in their basement, right? So they decided to temporarily print some paper money. So that's what they started doing. So the island council decided to print 3,000 extra island dollars and give this paper money to each islander uh, so that they could just go back to using this interim arrangement with this $3,000 to start buying and selling whatever they, whatever they wanted so that the island could buy some time while they waited to rebuild their computer center and get their old payment system back up and running. So that was the reason for distributing this $3,000 so people could continue to buy and sell the basic essential uh, requirements uh, for groceries, food, uh, produce, etc. So life could go on while they waited for the computer system to come back up to restore the earlier payment system. The second month, so they did this in the first month, they gave everybody $3,000, right? The second month, the payment system is still down. So the 3,000 paper money distributed to each islander during the first month of the crisis after the payment system went down, ensured that the islanders could sustain the basic economic activity while they all waited for the crisis to pass, all right? So with the $3,000 they got, they managed to survive that first month. They could buy what they wanted, they could sell what they had, etc. So when the second month arrived and the payment system was still not ready, it was still down, they still had, didn't have the computers working, the island council decided to print an additional $3,000 for the second month for distribution to every islander to ensure that everybody had enough money to pay for essentials even in the second month. So what they did in the first month, 3,000, they decided to give 3,000 to everybody equally in the second month as well. Now, since the Island Council was paying every Islander $3,000 each month, all Islanders who could not work had their jobs suspended. So suspended means there was nothing practically wrong with the jobs, but because people could not work, their jobs were suspended because the, nobody could afford to pay them their real salaries until the payment system was restored. But they still had enough money because of the 3,000 for buying basic essentials to, to, to survive. By the third month, the payment system was still not up and running, but there seemed to be hope that they were getting close to fixing the problem so they could get the basic systems up and running. So the Island Council approved an additional 3,000 to all Islanders. So for the third month, they distributed 3,000 again to every single Islander, just to allow everybody to survive. Thankfully, by the fourth month, the island finally restored their payment system. And, and since their digital system was now back up and running, 
they decided to allow any islander who had the temporary paper money introduced during the crisis to come back and exchange that paper money for a credit of equal value into their digital payment system account balance. So we are all familiar with this in India because we already did this once with the demonetization in India, where we had to go and exchange the old money that had lost its value for the new money that the government was uh, giving us, right? So a similar thing, go back with whatever paper money you have after the crisis and then put it back into your digital money uh, balance and you're good. And life on the island immediately went back to the normal before the crisis, right? So after the four months of uncertainty and chaos, driven by the downtime of their payments and so their monetary system, now everything went back to normal. Uh, and what we will do next is, while it's straightforward to understand, I'm hoping what I've described, we will look at the impact of the actions taken by the island council to temporarily introduce paper currency and distribute $3,000 of island dollars each month equally to each islander. Let's look at the impact of that at a level that I hope everybody should be able to understand. So the impact of the stimulus of $3,000 to each islander during every month of the crisis, since the island, was cut, the island was cut off from the rest of the world in 2000, they established their own payments and monetary system. So this is a quick summary, right? Once they had the first crisis in 2020 years ago, they established their own payment system. Having started out by distributing $100,000 to each islander, the total money in the system was now 1 billion. Remember, there are 10,000 people on the island and they gave everybody $100,000 of new island dollars. So that was a total of $1 billion that they created to allow things to economic activity to start on the island, right? So uh, $100,000 each multiplied by 10,000 people who existed on that island equals to 1 billion. When the payment system went down, the island council printed $3,000 extra cash for each islander every month, if you remember, right? So the first month they did this, they added or inflated the money supply by $30 million or 3%. So there was uh, a certain amount of $1 billion existed in the economy and they gave everybody $3,000, which was the equivalent of increasing the quantity of money in their system by 3%, fine? Right? Now, the Island Council approved a stimulus of 3,000 per month and provided this newly printed cash of 3,000 to each Islander for the first three months of the crisis. So they had added or inflated 90 million or 9% of additional money was introduced into their system, all right? So you have to remember one thing which is very important. When, the, when this island council uh, decided to print 9% of additional money and distribute it to the islanders, the important thing to understand is that 9% was distributed equally to all those 10,000 people. So while the increase in money of 9% would have diluted the holdings of money saved by all the islanders based on what was in the system that existed, since they were compensated with, with that 9% directly, it kind of balances out. So there's really no dilution, but let's assume in the worst case scenario, it's a 9% dilution of their net worth and the 9% dilution of the value of all the goods that they have. Once the crisis was over in the fourth month and the payment system was back up and running, the practical impact was that every islander could go back to having the same number of island dollars that they had prior to the crisis stopping. So let's assume there was the rich, the middle class, and the poor before the crisis hit four months ago <clears throat> uh, in January. Uh, for four months, there was a suspension of reality as we know it, and everybody got the $3,000 a month to manage. And after four months, everybody came out of the crisis with the system coming back. Everybody went back to having the same savings or net worth. So the rich continued to be rich, the middle class continued to be where they are, and the poor actually got a boost and not only got a boost, they survived that four months crisis, right? So everything is good coming out of it. So those islanders who during those three or four months collected more paper cash dollars. Uh, so let's say as the 3000 was distributed, right? Somebody had a lot of rice, somebody had a lot of bananas. So they would have accumulated money because they would have managed to sell their rice and sell their bananas. So the paper cash that they accumulated would be given back to the, the island council who would count that paper cash and give them a credit in their digital system. So they, they would have gotten richer by that much uh, because they actually accumulated or did well during the crisis. Now, assuming there was no inflation, so I was just talking about it. So assuming for the last 20 years, there was no inflation because we only gave $100,000 and then the stimulus injection was $90 million into their money supply. 
uh, we would have the worst case scenario is a 9% inflation, right? Where you have 9% of extra money created to accommodate and pay for that $3,000 every month. So for all practical purposes, a 9% increase in all products and services on the island post-crisis would be the worst case scenario. Now, this situation of 9% inflation would be a much more acceptable option for anybody rather than have the humanitarian crisis of a billion, I mean, hundreds of millions of people not having enough money to buy uh, their basic requirements for food and commodities, basic commodities, right, or basic essentials. Uh, so the council, the action the council uh, took by giving every island a $3,000 during the crisis actually helped prevent that humanitarian crisis. So that's the impact, right? Now let's look at this in a little more detail. Let's look at the real, now the thought experiment now is over. The thought experiment was just to help everybody understand the basics of how an economy works and the basics of money that is required to buy and sell and run the system that all of us just take for granted. So now let's look at the real numbers as of 20th April, 2020. So in the United States, uh, the United States government acted very quickly and approved a $349 billion stimulus for small business uh, to allow any company in the United States having up to 500 employees to apply and get a government small business loan for 2.5 times their monthly payroll cost. So any company from one employee all the way to 500 employees, whatever the money they needed to pay their salaries, the government has approved as a loan of up to 2.5 times that monthly salary as part of this program. And these, this $349 billion that was provided by the government was deployed actually on the 4th of April. Okay, on the 4th of April, this was deployed for them to actually roll this out and get money in the hands of the businesses so the businesses could pay salaries. Now, this official loan is then written off by the government or forgiven. So even though officially it's a loan, uh, you don't need to pay back the money as a business as long as within six months, you can provide the paperwork to the government that the money was actually used for paying salaries. So this is what the United States has already done as of the 4th of April. And the interesting thing is 12 days after they started it, the money ran out. And now either today on Monday or tomorrow on Tuesday, Congress in the US is going to approve, uh, I believe an additional $250 billion, if not more in support of this program. The US economy now to understand is $23 trillion. A trillion is 1000 billion, as you know, uh, as of 2020. So this $350 billion stimulus is creating an additional 1.5% of new money in their system, okay? Now the US can keep doing this and print up to $2.3 trillion, which would inflate their economy by 10%. So they've already got an approval to spend 10% of their GDP or to spend $2.3 trillion in support of the stimulus programs that they're putting in place. What I described about the small business program is one example of what they're doing. Now, when they do this, they will come out of the crisis in theory with everybody's net worth being diluted by 10%. So we spoke about what happens, right? When you introduce that 10% of new money in the system, the value of the existing money in theory goes down by 10% and a temporary one of inflationary number of 10%. Now, this is not true because that new money is going to the same people. It's going to everybody in a sense, right? So when the new money is going to everybody, yes, your existing money is getting diluted, but the new money makes up for that. So this scenario in the United States was accepted as being more acceptable than the alternative of chaos and then the ensuing humanitarian crisis. In India, India's economy is $3.2 trillion in 2020. Now, if India gives each Indian 18 years and above, so let's assume 18 years and above, you qualify for this program. And if India gives each adult 3,000 rupees per month, that adds up to $40 billion each month to pay $1 billion citizens okay now if you really look at the numbers uh, india has a population of greater than 1.3 billion uh, but if you exclude the the indians who are below 18 years of age you actually get to a number that is just under 1 billion okay so 1 billion people would qualify if you say that the criteria to to get this 3000 rupees a month is you need to be 18 years or older 
So even if India gave 3,000 per month for six months, let's say this crisis stays for six months, to every citizen above the age of 18, it would be a total of $240 billion or just 7.5% of the Indian economy of 3.2 trillion. Now remember again, if the government is introducing an additional 7.5% of money into the system, yes, all of us get diluted by 7.5% for our existing money, but we are all getting the 3,000. So we are all being compensated. So on one side, you're getting diluted, but on the other side, you're getting the 3,000, whether you're rich, middle class or poor, and that compensates for the dilution, right? Now, if the government did this, uh, this would mean that India, if it came out of the COVID-19 crisis in six months, uh, during that time if the government distributed the 3,000 per month to each citizen, they can contain the chaos or otherwise certain humanitarian crisis that is going to unfold. Uh, and we would be able to come out of the crisis with a temporary one-off inflationary number of 7.5% and everybody's net worth would be diluted by 7.5%. Again, I've explained that is not real because on one side you're getting diluted, but the other side, you are the one getting the 3,000 a month. So you're getting compensated by the government giving everybody the 3,000 a month. So it's, but even then 7.5% dilution, I think all of us will accept that coming out of this crisis, knowing that our net worth is down by 7.5%, which obviously is still a temporary situation. Now, all the jobs that people are not able to work at during the crisis would be in a suspended state for six months. So everybody's still going to get the 3,000, so everybody can still survive. So imagine a family of four with two young children, husband and wife would get 3,000 plus 3,000, 6,000, and that is enough money to buy basic essential food and essential commodities to survive each month, okay? Everything else is suspended for six months. Uh, and, and the theory would be that once everything normalizes, all the jobs will be restored and the suspended reality for six months goes away and the normal reality that all of us are used to comes back up, okay? So India, interestingly, is well-structured to distribute money directly to its citizens. Uh, we have the capability to do it and the program that is in place in India called the Aadhaar program that all of you are very familiar with makes this actually very practical. Uh, the Aadhaar program is a biometric national identity program that today has 1.2 billion people registered already. So almost everybody in India now has an Aadhaar number and have their biometrics in the Aadhaar system. So what that means is to prevent fraud, if Aadhaar is used as a mechanism for distributing this 3,000 rupees, then one person cannot go and get paid twice for the same Aadhaar card in any given month, right? Because they're being authenticated or identified using their biometrics. So they can only get paid once a month and we can prevent fraud. Now, to, to put this into action, every financial institution in the country, and they can even expand this to telecommunication companies, any of these large companies with thousands of branches and operations around the country, even the non-banking financial institutions could be authorized to provide this 3,000 cash to anybody with an Aadhaar card once every month. The financial institution, the telcos, could be paid even a 5% fee. So in the US, that's what the US government has done. The banks get paid a 5% fee for distributing the $349 billion to any small business who applies for a loan. So something similar can be done here. A 5% fee could be given to the intermediaries like the banks, the financial institutions, um, the telcos, any, any industry that has branches in the thousands to make it available very widely. And a system to track this can be put in place very, very quickly. I mean, quite literally in 24 hours, a system can be put up that validates that for one Aadhaar number, you can only get paid once anywhere in India. So if any Aadhaar number was paid 3,000 3, rupees somewhere in India, Nowhere else that same Aadhaar number can get 3,000 till you cross over to the next month. So that's easy to do. Now, Aadhaar already has an API or an integration option, which allows anybody, any technology company can create an integration to Aadhaar so they can ensure that when they're giving the money to anybody with an Aadhaar card, they are expected to validate the biometrics of that person to ensure that there is no fraud. Right? You don't want to have somebody stealing 100 Aadhaar cards and then trying to use 100 Aadhaar cards to keep going back and getting their 3,000 
uh, rupees. Uh, because of the biometric identification and authorization, this can be prevented and each Aadhaar card can only get paid once. Now to prevent chaos, if the 3000 like I've touched on here is authorized for release through the maximum number of front end channels facing the citizens, then nobody will panic and the social distancing required in this COVID-19 crisis can still be maintained and people can go get their monthly allowance of 3000 from thousands of, of uh, locations across the country, uh, maybe hundreds of thousands of locations across the country. When you count all the financial institutions, all the branches, uh, all the telco branches, all the non-banking financial institutions. So the moment you open up for, to everybody, there's not going to be any rush in one certain location and social distancing can continue to be maintained. The prime minister could request, now this is a bonus, the prime minister can request a citizen saying, those of you who don't need this 3,000 rupees, please don't take it. And whatever is unutilized out of the 3,000, remember the, the, they have planned that everybody's going to take it. But whoever does not take it or chooses not to take it, and I'm sure there'll be a large number of people who just opt out saying they don't need the 3,000. That money can be deployed by the government to do parallel activities like maybe run a food stall at the panchayat level to make sure those basic requirements are met as an additional supplement to just giving the 3,000 rupees, right? Now, this is a key question because I have been in this debate now and, and one of the reasons of putting this video out is just to allow the crowd of the community to weigh in on what is going on and to put your opinion on this, to stamp your opinion on this, on what do you think is the right thing to do? So why is distributing money the best solution right now? So let me give you my perspective. It's close to one month since the lockdown in India started and the problem clearly is not access to essential goods and services like food and provisions. I've been in the same building in my apartment for the last one month and we have access, we just, we can order online, we can make calls and all the groceries and all the provisions are being delivered to our home. That is not a problem. Now, if you have money, all you need is money, right? If you have money, the existing system is working just fine. And if the existing system to allow everybody to survive has to continue for the next six months, it will continue to work just fine. Now, programs to distribute food to the poor are highly inefficient and prone to corruption, leakage, and wastage. We have seen this, right? We have seen, we need to learn from our history that such programs are extremely inefficient and not the right way to go. Uh, I mean, all the data shows that. Uh, I mean, it's just simpler and easier to give people money and let people decide what they want to buy with that money. Trying to target specific groups of people for such a stimulus aid is again a problem, as can you even imagine the administration and the controls that need to be put in place during such a crisis to control who is eligible for this? So you, that is not going to work. Everybody is eligible. As long as you have an Aadhaar card, you're eligible for 3,000 rupees every month. That's it, right? Uh, it, it, the, the, the latency and the challenges of putting in place an administration and a mechanism to check and control eligibility to decide who gets money is going to be a mess because, as you know, in India, there'll be a lot of leakage and there'll be a lot of wastage and a lot of inefficiency if you try to do that. On the other hand, if it's a blanket uh, rule that says anybody with an Aadhaar card will get 3,000 rupees once a month, it's very easy to administer and manage. Now, if the government decides to dilute everybody's net worth by 7.5% by printing the money required to distribute 3,000 each to every adult Indian, it is not really a dilution, which I touched on multiple times, because while your existing wealth gets diluted, you are also getting the additional 3,000 rupees yourself. Now, if, if the economy collapses, on the other hand, due to inaction, it is very difficult to build it all back up again which is why such an interim solution just makes tremendous sense. Uh, remember the Humpty Dumpty uh, nursery, right? Uh, all the king's horses and all the king's men could not put Humpty Dumpty together again. So if the system that we have collapses, it's going to be introducing significant pain for the medium to long term to rebuild a working model. So we have to try and manage uh, the crisis for the next few months to ensure that the system doesn't collapse. The biggest opportunity for India in this crisis is the fact that we already have a biometric identification system supported for the Aadhaar numbers. So it's very simple and practical to allow for anybody through multiple front end channels to get to that 3000 rupees and then they can use that 3000 rupees to buy whatever they want. It doesn't matter. In fact, when they use that 3000 rupees, it helps the economy because whatever they buy is going to help put the economy back on track sooner rather than later. Now, I have been defending my position for the last two weeks. 
around giving everybody money versus trying to do it selectively. I've decided to socialize these thoughts to allow the crowd and community to settle on what makes sense. Because time is of the essence. I mean, we can debate forever, but decisions need to be made. So if you can't blow holes in this plan that I'm proposing um, and you agree with it or you think it's the right way to go, please forward it for action. Because we, uh, this is just an attempt to try and get people to understand what is happening and what the possible options are. I think if we get the word out and propagate the message, then hopefully it'll get to the right people for the right action to be taken. Again, if you just go and look up what all the experienced economic advisors are rooting for, uh, folks like Raghuram Rajan and such, they are saying immediate distribution of cash to the poor and needy is essential. All right. And that, and that is absolutely critical to keep the system going. The approach proposed in this explainer video provides a mechanism to do this and to do it fast. Is the structure proposed here perfect? Absolutely not. But it can be fine tuned quickly to keep it real and practical. Time is of the essence and decisions have to be made quickly. The presenter, that's me. So my IT company, Glaces Technologies, we've been actively engaged for the last 12 days to support the US financial institutions who are our customers in implementing and rolling out the small business uh, paycheck protection program in, in the US. So what we learned there, you know, the SBA PPP program in the US is the distribution of $349 billion to small businesses. And the genesis of the key ideas in this presentation are driven by our experience doing this in the US through the US financial institutions in support of this program that the US launched on the 4th of April. Please comment below this YouTube video. I'm happy to answer any questions to clarify further. Thank you for your time and for listening. I've tried my best to keep it concise uh, and I hope this makes sense. If this makes sense to you, please get the word out. As I mentioned, time is of the essence.